Thank you, Helen. Um, good morning, everyone. It is lovely to see actual people. Um, I've done a couple of talks virtually over the past lockdown times, but I am debuting this new talk for the first time in front of real people, so not scary at all. Um, so Design for Developers is a bit of a whistle-stop tour of design principles and applications, uh, especially relevant for the web. Uh, I, want, I wanted to write this talk because uh, I work with developers a lot and they often um, will ask me to share some tips and tricks. They usually say I'm maybe too technically minded to be creative, which I don't think is true. Um, I don't think that there's one or the other, really. Um, and most of the time they've had to either create designs for themselves or they're stuck being the designer slash developer um, in a company that doesn't have a designer. Um, but whoever you are and whatever you do, I'm grateful that you're here. So who am I? Uh, I'm Lex Lofthouse. I use she, her pronouns and my handle on almost everything is at Loftio. Uh, I've been a designer for about 10 years. Um, about 10 years now, I uh, moved to Nottingham in 2011 and uh, started my career here after studying in Scotland. Um, I've had a fair chunk of content cut out of this, so I'm not going to dwell on who I am and I'm going to start to talk about what this talk is. By starting about what this talk isn't, um, it's a bit of a preface. Oh. Um, I've got 60 minutes, which sounds like a lot, but it's not. Um, I'm going to be teaching, uh, not going to be teaching you uh, everything I've learned in my design education and career, and I think we all know that. Um, and I'm also not going to be teaching you any code-based technique. I don't really know how to code. <laughs> and I'm speaking here at DDD. The third D is for designer. Um, so <laughs> most of the time I hand over uh, my designs to a front-end dev. Um, so I'm not qualified enough to teach you about code. So I'm not going to talk about that. What I am going to talk about is some fundamental principles of design, firstly. Second, some common design elements, so um, the pieces, the building blocks. Um, and lastly, I'm going to do some examples. I was originally going to live design, but that was so ambitious. Um, I'm just going to do some before and afters of like existing design and some ways that we can improve that. So let's get started. Let's start with the principles of design. So there's no real law about how many principles there are. Uh, some will say there's four, some will say five, six, seven, so on. I think that four is enough, especially to go over today. They're relevant to consider and remind yourself of when you are designing for the web. Um, so these four elements are hierarchy, proximity, contrast, and balance. So let's look into what each of these mean. Hierarchy. So similarly to how we think of hierarchy in business and society and nature, um, it's a system in which things are arranged according to importance. So in design, we achieve this visually. Uh, we create elements, put them in a clear order of priority. Um, and I guess in development terms, a common way that we implement this um, as an example is in text headings. So H1, H2, H3, and when we set the styles for these, they go in that order of importance. So that's hierarchy. Um, hierarchy is a relatively easy principle, I think, to implement, because there are a few ways to do it. Uh, one of the easiest ones is scale. Uh, the biggest thing on the page is usually the most prominent. Um, other ways uh, is including the placement, where, the pla uh, where items are placed on the page which leads me nicely into the second design principle, proximity. So proximity is, a set, uh, is part of a larger set of principles called Gestalt principles, and I hope I said that right. Uh, they were discovered uh, back in the first half of the 20th century by psychologists who were looking to understand how humans um, made sense of the world and how we decided that things belonged together. And proximity was a big part of that. So when it comes to design, proximity uh, is looking at the content, understanding the relationship it has to other pieces of content and placing them together in a way that makes sense. 
So the distance or the lack of distance between items helps us understand those connections to each other. So to use text as an example again, if we have a heading and a paragraph of text sitting closely underneath it, I think we can safely assume that those things belong together because of their proximity to one another. That heading's probably going to introduce what the next paragraph of copy says. So that's proximity. Next principle is contrast. Uh, so contrast is used to help emphasize objects in our design, uh, highlight elements against one, uh, one another. So this is achieved by having things be the opposite to one another or close to opposite, doesn't have to strictly be uh, opposite. Um, and it can be used in different ways. Uh, sometimes we use it for emphasis. So, uh, and that sort of comes back to the hierarchy principle too. So we might really want to highlight something on a page um, and we can do that by making a contrast with something else, make it stand out, give it importance. Other times contrast is just a crucial part of the interface. So white text on a black background is great contrast, but it's just used to make things easy to read. Um, and contrast doesn't always apply to color either. Uh, it can be achieved in other ways such as choosing a juxtaposing font, uh, font choices or different scales in shapes. Uh, the key thing about contrast is that it helps the user um, know where to look first. It creates a form of visual impact. Okay, one more principle is balance. So there's two types of balance in design really. There is symmetrical balance and there is asymmetrical balance. Um, both rely on elements working alongside each other um, and essentially it's weight distributed across your design. So symmetrical balance means that you have a design that's evenly displayed, uh, often with a kind of invisible center line down the middle, um, and it relies on the elements being equal to each other. Um, it's quite a, it brings kind of satisfaction to a design um, and consistency in layout. And it's pretty easy to achieve. Uh, asymmetrical balance is more about tension, elements uh, offsetting each other. It's kind of unequal weight, um, gives a sense of movement and a bit of visual impact. The downside with asymmetrical balance is that it's a little more complex to pull off. Um, but both of these offer a form of balance. So these are our four design principles. And the idea with these is that we always keep them in mind, keep them in the back of our head, because uh, they're the key to creating a good design. If we're talking about a design in terms of Lego, these are the instructions, because you can kind of loosely keep to them. Um, and now I want to introduce some of like the major building blocks, the pieces of Lego uh, that build our design. So I'm gonna call them design elements. You can call them whatever you want. Um, <laughs> So I'm gonna keep it simple again. Uh, let's split this into four key areas. So we've got uh, typography, we've got color, we've got imagery, and we've got layout. So these four visual design elements implemented alongside our principles are the key to creating a good design. Uh, four design principles, four elements, let's keep it simple. Uh, so I want to run through with what each of these are and also give you some tips on how you can use each of these things. So let's start with typography. So typography is the art and technique of arranging type. Um, we take the content, we apply font choices, sizes, spacing, color, etc. So step one in typography is fonts. Um, so Typography isn't just the fonts. Uh, every designer will bang on to you about that. Um, but it does start with choosing fonts. Um, that is step one. So uh, you might be working on a project and you might not need to choose fonts at all, in which case, hooray. Um, but you might be faced with the dilemma of choosing fonts. Um, so how do you do this? Well. I suggest choosing a font pairing uh, for your project if you have to start from scratch. So I will call this easy mode. If you have to choose fonts, 
Choose one font for headings and choose one font for body copy. That's it. Some people will choose more, some people could choose one font and make it work. But I find that this is the easiest method and a good place to start. So for headings, you can be a bit braver with headings. They're usually short, uh, large, more attention grabbing pieces of copy. So you can be a bit more bold with your font choice. Um, you can choose something a bit more decorative. Um, but the main thing is that you need to choose a font that represents the brand that you're working on. With your body copy or paragraph text, um, you need to go a bit more simple with this um, because typically this will be used in larger paragraphs of text and at a smaller size. Um, so you have to think about the readability of the font. Um, it's important to know that whatever fonts that you choose or are asked to use are licensed properly. Um, so always check that. There are loads of different licensing options with fonts, so please do your research. Alternatively, you could pick a free to use font. Um, there are some great resources out there. The best one, I think, and that we all probably know of is uh, Google Fonts. So there are small file sizes, they're free to use, easy to embed, and there are over a thousand uh, on their site. So um, yeah, this is a great site to use. You can narrow your search down and you can preview stuff. Um, so I would definitely recommend that um, as a good starting point. So when we're choosing our fonts, how do we ensure um, that they're going to work together and that they're going to represent uh, the brand? So fonts kind of need to embody the brand or complement the style and tone of the brand that you're working on. If you're working on a tech brand, for example, a nice kind of modern style font will do. Um, if you're working on a brand that is aimed towards children, maybe a more fun, rounded font, that kind of thinking. Um, you wouldn't choose like Comic Sans to design a really important warning sign, <laughs> or would you? <laughs> um, so I'd like to show you some better examples of some font choices um, for certain brands. So I'm going to use some places around Nottingham to demonstrate this. So this is an example for Nottingham Castle. This location has heritage, it has history. Um, so I've gone for a heading font that can convey that type of tone. Uh, that heading font echoes the type styles of that era um, and it's got some good character to it. I've complemented this with a body copy choice um, of a serif font here. Again, it's got that kind of traditional feel to it and it complements the heading font well. This embodies the brand. Uh, to keep things really simple, uh, I've chosen all Google fonts. Also because I've done this in Google Slides, so they're really easy to access. <laughs> Um, so secondly, here's a font choice for Nottingham Contemporary. Um, this time we're looking at a kind of modern heading, really bold, eye-catching. Again, has good character to it, but I wouldn't particularly use it for a body copy font. Instead, for the body copy font, um, I've got a really simple sans serif font here. Um, and it's really easy to read once you start going smaller and smaller with it. If you're ever looking for a really easy choice for a body copy font, Open Sans is a really good one. Um, it is just really simple um, and works well. And it's got a lot of different font weights to it as well. Uh, lastly, Attenborough Nature Reserve. So I've chosen this heading font because it's a bit more hand-drawn, a bit more natural in feel. Um, and I've set it in a green to try and convey that brand. Um, I've paired this with a serif font underneath, but equally, I think we could use that Open Sans font from before. Um, there is not always one answer when it comes to design. In fact, there's never one answer when it comes to design. Um, but there are some wrong ones, like that Comic Sans choice. So please do bear that in mind. Uh, and this is just to show the font choices here. Uh, there is a good tool to give you a hand with this font pairing stuff, uh, fontjoy.com. Uh, you can uh, test out, test drive uh, some font pairings here, and it uh, uses some Google fonts as well. Fantastic resource that I use myself. Um, so let's say we've got our font pairing chosen. 
Now, what do we do with them? Um, well, we have to apply those font choices and create some text styles. Uh, so, let's start with our headings. Uh, you've chosen a font. We have to set up some heading styles now. So, um, this comes back to our hierarchy principle that we were speaking about before. Um, heading styles need to follow um, hierarchy as they are named, one being the most prominent, four being less so. Um, and I've just put two examples here. I'm using the same font here, or the same font family, um, but this is just two kind of methods of creating successful heading styles. Um, the first one, the one on the left, uh, just uses scale. Just uses scale, uh, everything's the same. Whereas our example on the right here, it also uses scale, but um, our third example is set in italics. Uh, and our fourth example is in all caps and with a bit more character spacing. So there's different ways of doing this. Um, if you want to keep it dead simple, just use scale. If you want to get a bit braver, you can start experimenting with other styles. Um, but again, this uses the method of one font for headings, one font for body copy. So body copy, slightly easier one to get right. Um, keep it dead simple. Uh, once you've chosen your body copy font. Usually I like to set two sizes to start with. Might have more as we go on. Um, but I usually create an introductory paragraph, which is the first bit. And then um, the second paragraph is how I would set just my uh, go-to kind of paragraph uh, copy style. And I think you're all reading this now. And yes, I've pulled this from the first Pokemon movie. It wouldn't be a talk without Pokemon reference in it from me. Um, but with this, um, you've got your heading styles, you've got some body copy stuff. Um, and uh, there is another tool, again, which helps with some of this called type-scale.com. There's not really a set rule into how to scale your headings. It depends what you're working on. Um, but this tool is fantastic in giving you um, some scales to start with. And also, you can test this with your body copy as well. Great tool, and it's also Google font friendly. So now we've got our fonts and sizes. The last thing we need to do is figure out the spacing, which sounds really boring, but it's very important, and it is often overlooked. So first, there's two things for spacing, really. Uh, first is line height, so that's spaces between continuous lines of copy. Uh, here's three examples. Um, of different line heights to demonstrate the power of getting this right. Um, it's a bit of a Goldilocks situation. Uh, on this end of the scale, the line height is really small. Um, the text is really difficult to read. It's all smushed together. Um, but sometimes our line height is like this by default, and we need to adjust it, because um, that is not particularly readable. Other end of the spectrum is this. The line height is huge. My old mentor, when I was a junior designer, used to tell me off for this and say you could fit a bus through those lines, um, which is true, because in a different way, this is a lot harder to read. Um, it just makes the whole paragraph very disjointed. Our example in the middle is more along the lines of what we want to get right. Um, there's enough space to make it easy to read, but not so much that the lines are so far apart from each other. This comes back down to that proximity principle. So if things are too far away from each other, it looks like they don't belong. Uh, the second bit is paragraph spacing. So this is the space before and after paragraphs um, and between headings as well. So here's two examples. Um, our example on the left, not great. Our example on the right is a lot more along the lines of what we want to do with paragraph spacing. So on the right, our space between our paragraphs and uh, between the heading and the paragraph should be about the same, like so. That ensures that these bits of text looks like, look like they belong together. And then our space at the end of the paragraph and before the next bit of te text needs to be a bit more than that. Um, that gives the user a bit of a moment of pause while reading, um, but it also shows um, that it's separated from the next section. Again, that proximity principle is really important here because um, if we compare that to an example on the left, these spacings are a little uh, off and uh, don't really show uh, the belonging 
of these bits of text, as you can see. Um, so now you've got some typography tips under your belt. <laughs> what is the next bit? Uh, color. So uh, I want to just cover some tips really around creating a color palette. Um, so similarly to our fonts, you might already be, be working with a color palette. Um, you might have an entire one or maybe a couple of colors um, to use, which is great. However, you might also need to start from scratch. So how do we choose colors? Start with one, because um, creating an entire color palette is a daunting enough task for a designer, let alone someone who isn't one. Um, if you have a main brand color, start with that and then you can build on it. So this should be the main color you want to associate with your brand, uh, like EasyJet, orange, O2, blue, Starbucks green, you know. Uh, start with that as your main color. Then when you've got that, you can build out color palettes. Um, so like our fonts, I would suggest two, not two colors, two color palettes, um, a primary one, not to be confused with primary colors, um, and a secondary palette. So your primary palette will be the most used colors in your design. The secondary palette will be more supporting ones that are used a little less often. So the best way to showcase this is to show you, I think, a real example um, from the wild. Um, so I'm going to use Uber as an example. So this is Uber's primary color palette. It's three colors. That is it. The main colors are black and white, and they are great because they are contrasting colors. Um, Uber can use these um, really effectively in their design because they contrast. Again, one of our design principles that we spoke about. Um, so it's important to consider um, including some contrasting colors. Uh, the third color, the blue, is more of an accent color, but it works well alongside the black and the white as well. They use this in their brand uh, in quite a considered way. It represents the brand's values around safety. They call it a safety color. Um, but it's used to highlight where there might be a key offering, message, feature, alert. Um, so here's an example of that in action. Uh, the example on the left is their website. So you can see how the black and white works really well in terms of contrast. Um, and then the blue starts to come in when they are um, talking about their product offering. The example on the right is from the Uber app itself. So the blue is even more limited here, um, but it's used really well. Um, so most of it's black and white, the interface, but I've clearly got a message there and they use that blue to highlight that. So this is Uber's secondary color palette. So you might not think that Uber really use these colors much, maybe the green with Uber Eats. Um, but it contains twice as many colors, <coughs> um, but they use a lot more sparingly um, across their design, mostly in their illustration style. Um, and they work well, again, alongside that primary palette too. So here's some examples of this in action. So, um, you can see that the colors and shades thereof are being used in their illustration style. So this primary and secondary palette structure um, is not just used for contrast, um, but it also defines a hierarchy um, in the design. So again, one of our other principles, the secondary palette is typically used for supporting elements and that primary palette is used for the main interface. Um, Uber never deviate from these colors, really, um, and that keeps them on brand, brand uh, keeps them recognizable as well. Uh, lastly, I think it's uh, beneficial to add some neutral tones to a color palette. Uh, this can help if you want to add some layering and depth. So again, an example from Uber. Um, you can't really see the gray on that. <laughs> Um, they do use some neutral grey tones um, to separate some elements of the interface here. Um, and yes, can't really see it on here. But um, neutral doesn't always mean greys. Uber use a grey because um, black and white is their main colours. Um, but it could just mean some um, lighter shades of your main brand colour. So for choosing colours, again, I've got more resources. I've got resources in every area here. Um, Adobe Colors is a really good tool because you can start with a main color and then expand upon that. There's different criteria and there's different um, outputs for the color as well. Even CMYK if you're going to do some print and stuff. Um, so that's a great tool. Also, I like this one. It's called Coolers. 
cool as, I think. Uh, it's a bit more random though. Um, you can auto-generate palettes and then lock in colors. So good for a bit of experimenting to start with. Um, but it does have some other cool features. You can upload a photo and it will generate a palette. Uh, you can explore gradients, if that's what you want to do. They're back in now. Um, and they also have an accessibility um, checker for color contrast, um, which is the next bit I want to touch on. Uh, test your color palettes for accessibility standards. So I know as developers, you've probably got loads of accessibility standards to meet. As a designer, getting the colors right is the lowest bar um, when it comes to accessibility for us. Um, but it's very often overlooked. So um, there's different um, standards out there for you to meet. Um, so it's important that you do because as someone who doesn't have a vision impairment, it's very easy um, to overlook that fact. So coolers have got one. Um, Web AIM, A -I -M? I don't know, never say it out loud. Um, but they also have a contrast checker, which is a bit more comprehensive. Um, so you can put in your foreground color, your background color, and then adjust those if you need to in order to meet those standards. Um, there are many other people that speak in more detail about this um, in terms of accessibility and uh, inclusive, uh, the inclusive web. Good, Kellen. <laughs> um, but I thought it was important to just bring this up at this point while we're talking about colors. Uh, so let's discuss imagery. Um, I'm going to break this down into three areas. So photography, illustration, and iconography. So let's start with photography. So it's likely that you might have some photography to start, perhaps. Um, so it's good to ask yourself some questions. Uh, do I need to add some photos? Are they high quality enough? Am I going to need to source some additional photos or the whole library entirely? Um, and as well as this, you might be working with photos from a database, ones that you don't really have any control over. Um, product photos, if you're doing an e-commerce site, user-generated photos, avatars, things like that. Um, but you can think about the treatment of those images as well. So it's important to take stock of where you are to begin with. Speaking of stock, if you want to add some more photos, you can go down the route of stock photography. Um, it's important to source licensed photography for your site. Um, used to be a costly exercise, but now there are a couple of free resources which are really good to pull from. And again, I've got another reference. I will put these slides on Twitter, by the way, because there's loads of resources in here. Um, so I will uh, post that out later. But um, these are two great uh, stock photo resources with free photos. Um, so that's Unsplash and Pexels. And uh, yeah, they've got a wide range of images and you won't hit any legal issues. Word of warning when it comes to stock photos, avoid the cheesy ones. There's a lot of cheesy ones out there and there is a reason that a lot of memes <laughs> originate from actual stock images. Um, so yeah, try and avoid this stuff. So <laughs> let's say you've got some photography now, fantastic. Uh, there's some things that you need to consider um, before you go ahead and use those photos. Um, so the treatment of photos uh, means you can add a bit of interest or enhance some photos uh, in some ways. So the first is the framing of an image. So are you going to crop these images uh, into portrait, landscape, square, or perhaps some slightly different shapes? Um, it's an important consideration to make because uh, not all photos work well in different frames or crops, so you need to be mindful of this. Uh, ensuring that the focal point of your image is framed correctly really is uh, hit or miss when it comes to design, really. It's important to get right. Um, it can also add some visual interest to your design, how you frame things, so you don't have to stick to rectangles. Uh, and secondly, think about what effects or filters, um, or editing you might want to do to photos. You don't need Photoshop for it anymore. And Affinity are here today as well, actually, so they might talk to you about it. Um, there's loads of different options 
uh, these days when it comes to filtering. Um, the black and white approach is pretty classic, um, but the benefit of adding a color filter is that you can add consistency to photos that might not necessarily have it. If you've pulled photos from different sources, um, you can add that consistency. Alternatively, you could go for something a bit more funky. This is like a duotone image, which yes, is probably a bit 2015 Spotify now, but you can start to add in your brand colors um, and maybe do something like that. So uh, adding effects, it's not a necessity, but it might be something you want to experiment with. So that's photo-based imagery. There is another option, which is illustrations. Again, something that's kind of on trend at the minute. Um, so you need to think about whether illustrations is even an option you want to go down, uh, route you want to go down, shall I say? Uh, do, does it fit into your style? Um, if it doesn't, great, you don't have to worry about it. Um, but uh, if it does, uh, you might want to think about how do you source illustrations similarly to our photography. Option one, you could do it yourself. If you think that you're skilled enough to do some illustration work, fantastic. Upside here is that you can add illustrations without barriers um, and it might be a bit of a more financially sound choice. Second option, you can commission someone else to do it. It costs a bit more money, but it will be bespoke, you'll get quality artwork, and it'll be unique to your site, and you can set the brief for it. Alternatively, there is stock resources for illustration as well. Um, there are quite a lot out there now, ever since illustration kind of, I blame Airbnb, uh, they made it popular. Um, but there are some resources. Uh, Blush.design is a great one. Um, this pulls in illustrations from various different contributors as well. So there's different styles and there's free and paid options on there. You can customize them as well. So lastly, under that imagery category, I want to touch on icons. So we all know what icons are. Um, iconography is an age old way of communicating. We see it every day. You can see it on that fire exit sign. You can, I'll try to look for another example. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, put simply, icons just help point us in the right direction or give context. Um, the main benefit of using them on the web is that we can put them alongside things. We can help signpost our users. Um, and it is a very common uh, feature of an interface, which you've probably used before. Um, I only really want to give you two major tips when it comes to iconography. Um, I don't think I need to dwell on it too hard. I don't think it's rocket science. But there are some very common pitfalls. First, only use an icon on its own if it can represent itself um, clearly. Um, we can kind of take for granted that if we're working on something and we know what an icon means, that the end user is going to know what it means. So let me show an example. These are three pretty common icons uh, that we'll see across the web. They are very familiar, and it's probably safe to say that users know what these mean. Three lines is a menu, the magnifying glass is search, and the trash can is going to be a delete action. These are called universal icons. Um, we don't need uh, to describe what they are, really. Everyone knows. However, uh, there are icons where they might be a bit more ambiguous. Uh, let's consider what these ic icons might represent. The first one, like, favorite, favorite or is it an add to wish list button? Um, the context could probably give us some good clues here, but it's not that clear. Uh, second one, probably a repost button or a retweet or something like that but it could also be refresh. Um, and that last one on the end could be a live chat. It could be a link through to an FAQs. It's not clear um, exactly what these icons are. They're not as common um, as our first ones. So if they are not clear enough, give them a label. Um, labeling icons um, is really important. It gives the user confidence in knowing what they're clicking. The second point is keep icons simple. Um, icons need to be used at really small screen sizes 
and they're often devoid of detail because they need to be. Um, they need to communicate a point in very little pixels. Um, so I'll take it back to that search icon before. This icon works really, really big or really, really small. It is such a simple representation, but that is the making of a great icon. So again, I've got a couple of good resources for icons. I'm not expecting you to go drawing them yourself, but you can. Um, but these two resources are really good. Font Awesome um, is a set of icons. Uh, there's free options, there's paid options, and they are font-based or vector-based. I've used them quite a lot. Um, and then there's the Noun Project, which um, is lots of different contributors uh, on there. Again, they have some paid options, some free options. Um, on there as well. So that's imagery. Um, let's move on to the. This is the second Spider Man reference today. Okay, cool. Uh, let's move on to the final area of visual design elements. So that is layout, uh, putting all the elements together. Um, so where do we start with this? Uh, grids uh, is a good place to start, gives you a good foundation. Um, for any layout, gives you coordinates to put things on page. So 12 column grids or 12 column layouts uh, is what I would usually use. Uh, the columns are divisible by loads of different numbers and that's why you use 12 column. You can divide it by 2, 3, 4 and 6 and 1 and 12 if we want to go that small. Um, but really versatile when it comes to creating components that make the web and when we start looking at responsive design um, it is especially uh, important so here's to a typical 12 column layout um, you can configure this however you need to um, i'm sure a lot of you have heard of flexbox or css grid so this is not a revolutionary concept in development that i'm trying to talk about however it is an even less modern concept in design these column grids have been around since books have been being printed um, and it's something that you study in graphic design in print as well. But I wanted to discuss them today because um, it helps us bring balance to our layout, that design principle that we were speaking about before, um, especially that symmetrical ba balance as well. Um, so it's good to consider from that point of view. So we can have a two column layout here these squares could contain anything, by the way. Um, you know, that could be two columns of text, that could be an image and a bit of text, it could be videos, whatever it is, doesn't really matter. But this is us creating some balance in our layout. Three columns, again, allows us to add some elements but still create that balance. Uh, four column layouts, great, because once you start going down responsively, you can get a two by two grid. This is my favorite one, it's an even number, it's lovely. Um, you can even have six columns as well. You know, this is good if you've got some icons um, to put in these narrow columns. Um, yeah, versatile layout. I can't really stress enough how imperative uh, this is when you start um, placing elements on a page. Um, so yeah. So we've got a grid, cool. Uh, what goes into those columns? Well, I wanted to speak about components, so these are like the repeatable elements of an interface. Um, so we want to start small, really, when we start building a component, especially um, if we're applying some uh, styles to it. Um, so we'll start small, get bigger, and start to build up repeatable elements. So I kind of want to go through this using a framework called Atomic Design. Um, Atomic Design is a framework for uh, breaking down a layout into a system of elements. Uh, the methodology uses these terms to talk about how we break down elements. So atoms, they are the smallest pieces of the interface. Molecules, built up of one or more atoms. Uh, organisms are built up of one or more, one or more, two or more molecules. Um, and then that builds up to pages uh, and templates from there, but I'm just going to stick to these for now. So atoms refers to the most basic building blocks of the web, singular elements. In terms of web, this could be a label, tiny little label, could be a text input, could be a button. Uh, basically like atoms in nature, 
These elements are important, but they're not super useful on their own. They need to be put together with other elements to start making something bigger. That is where molecules come in. So molecules are where two or more atoms combine in order to create a bigger part of the interface. Suddenly, that label, that text input, and that button becomes a search bar. Um, so as you can see, when we start combining these things, we start to get bigger parts of the interface. Uh, so this is a molecule. This method helps us start at the bottom and build up um, because it can be quite overwhelming to try and do everything at once. So this is a great way of breaking it down. So from molecules, we move up to organisms. So in a similar fashion, organisms are two or more molecules combined. So that search bar is a molecule. Um, when we combine that with other atoms or molecules, we could start to put together a menu, navigation on a site. So logo, text links. I don't know if you want to add a basket link or an account. These little pieces start to build together combining with other atoms and molecules to create organisms. And this is a great way of thinking about repeatable elements within our site. For example, this is an example of a molecule um, that we typically see on a blog, a blog card. Um, so the atoms that make up this molecule, I realize that the contrast on this is not very good. Um, <laughs> maybe I should have made things a bit a bit more contrasty. That's one of the design principles I should have known better. Um, but we have a container on the right, we have an image, we've got category, button, date, author, title, description. These are all atoms and they come together and form the molecule. So when we've got our molecules, um, we start to put them together with other molecules and make organisms. So this is an example of just repeating the same molecule over again. We've got a blog listing if we do that. Um, so it really goes to show how those tiny elements can build up and create larger ones. Um, if there is just one thing that you take away from this talk, um, I want it to be that. Uh, start small and build up from there because I know how daunting it can be uh, to create a design when... It's daunting to create a design when you're a designer for 10 years, let alone someone who isn't. So. Um, even I start with the smallest little steps. Uh, so before I move on, I just wanted to put the reference to atomic design here. Um, so th I think this started off as a blog by Brad Frost. Um, I've lifted from it considerably and condensed it down into a few slides. So if you want to read a bit more about this, uh, he's got a book and a website now as well, atomicdesign.bradfrost.com. And I think he's updated this with some more stuff as well. So, <sighs> that is the whistle stop tour of uh, design principles and design elements. So now I would like to end this talk with some examples of, like I said, before and after of elements of an interface that we might typically um, need to design for or might see in our day to day. Uh, I'm not gonna start from scratch, like I said, live designing was super ambitious and I'm not that confident a person to do that in front of you all. So I'm gonna show some befores and afters. So this first example is um, kind of like our blog card before, but this is for a house that is for sale. Um, so we've got all the information we need here really. We have the uh, price, the location, the spec, um, the image, some controls there as well. Um, but what we're really lacking is some good hierarchy and a bit of balance here. So how can we improve that? Oh yeah, the contrast on this is not great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so both of these cards display the exact same information. They perform the same function, but there's some big differences. Um, so hierarchy, we've made the price um, the biggest kind of element here that is uh, important to the user and the seller. Um, we've used some icons to help condense this and in the context of this, these icons make sense and we probably don't have to label them. Um, as well as that, we've used some, well I've tried to use some separation in some neutral tones but you can't really see them. But that bottom bit with the logo uh, and the contact info um, is separated out in a grey. 
Um, and I've used the logo as well um, for some recognition for the estate agent. Um, and lastly, we've, that example on the left has got some controls for the gallery of images, um, but they're quite small. Um, so I've put them into context, I've put them over the image, I've added in the controls on either side, um, and again, used an icon to show how many images there are. So small adjustments, but a big change. So let's look at a pop-up here. Um, now, this lesson is mostly in hierarchy, but also a little bit of microcopy as well. So here's the problem with our example on the left here. Um, this is a destructive action, an irreversible one, and the warning for this is super, super small. Um, and also the buttons here don't really have any differentiation. They're not really helping us make the right decision. So how do we improve this? So firstly, let's make that warning a bit more prominent. Maybe let's use an icon to show that it's a warning, something that you need to read. Stick it at the top, creates a sense of hierarchy too, rather than underneath where you might have already pressed the button before you even read it. Um, so I've also swapped uh, the order of the buttons and I've changed the copy. So instead of yes, no, I've tried to make the actions a lot more clear for what they're going to do to the user. Um, this is just a great um, thing when it comes to buttons. Um, if you say exactly what the button's going to do, the user is going to be confident in their choice. Um, so I've gone with delete and cancel instead. Uh, and yeah, I've swapped these around, usually putting the main action on the right is a good thing. Um, and I've created um, some contrast here and a bit of hierarchy with the color choices. So delete, I've put it in big scary red and cancel is a bit more secondary um, with a border outline. So again, these two examples do the same things. Um, it's just some small design choices that can really enhance that. Um, our next example here, uh, how can we make a radio button choice a bit more interesting? Um, well, it's as simple as starting with some hierarchy again. So the big difference between these choices, what needs highlighting the most? Um, so this is picking out a data plan. Um, it's probably the amount of data that you want. So let's make that bigger. Let's reduce down some of the elements. The name of the plan is the least important thing to the user. Um, the main thing for them is how much data uh, that they're going to get, as well as that, the price. But if you're the person selling this, you probably don't want the price to be the biggest thing. Um, however, we have put it in bold here to highlight it um, and separate those options out. Um, as well as that, try to create a bit of balance in this layout by putting each option into a little container. Um, makes it a bit more interesting, also gives the user a bigger hit area as well. Um, and lastly, our selected state here. This offers a huge amount of contrast. Um, so on the left, our only real indicator that we've chosen something is a small little radio button. On the right, the whole um, block has been highlighted. We've used an outline, we've used a bit of a tint, and we've also included an icon. So again, incremental changes. Uh, can really enhance kind of boring choices like this and just make the user experience a bit more enjoyable. So here's a quick example of how we can add a little more interest to a simple area of text. So this isn't a bad example, by all means. This does the job, um, but we can sharpen it up. Um, so our example on the, light, on the right, should I say, um, I've used a couple of different techniques here. So the first is that font choice. Um, I've just picked out the header in a bolder weight. Uh, this gives it more hierarchy. Um, also a bit of contrast on the page as well. I've sorted out my spacing and my line heights. Again, like I said, that's very important to get right. Um, on our example on the left, that second heading sitting a little bit too close to that paragraph and it's not separating out the sections of content. Um, so getting that uh, paragraph spacing is spot on. I've also, instead of some bullet points, bullet points are so boring. Um, I can't stand 
<laughs> they, 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 they serve a purpose. But if your content allows for it, you could replace that with some nice icons. Uh, this is a kind of step-by-step -step bit, so picking out some number icons works quite well. Um, and lastly, um, for my body copy choice, I've just gone slightly lighter with it in terms of color. Using a kind of two different tones there, um, again, can help with the contrast of those headings. Neither of these are wrong, but I know which one I prefer. So, oh, this is gonna be a, probably a really bad example with the, with the contrast of this screen, but we'll see how it turns out. Anyway, this is my arch nemesis. It is a table. Um, I hate designing for tables. They're so boring. They are so boring. Um, but there is a way to make them a bit nicer. Um, and that can sometimes come, in, come down to analyzing what content is there. Um, can we combine any of these columns? What can we do with what we've got? What is the purpose of it? Um, so we've got to think about that. Look at our actions at the end. They're all right, they're underlined, so I can see that they're a link and they do something in that way. But they don't really stand out very much. So how can we improve this? Oh, the contrast is not too bad. Okay. Um, so I've considered the context here and the content that I'm working with. Um, I know, because I'm working on this, I know that the name and the number are not things that we really need to differentiate in this table. Um, and I know that the plan and the plan price are also things we don't need to. So those options I've combined. Um, so name and number becomes one column. Uh, plan becomes one column as well. And that really gives us a bit more space to work within our table. Um, as well as this, I have added a bit of contrast to those options. While I've combined them, the name is the most important thing and the plan is also the most important thing here. So what I've done is I've picked one of them out in bold and the other one out in a light weight. Um, if you want to use bold to highlight something, this is always a good tip. Uh, if you want to use bold to highlight something, make sure that you also have a not bold option because if everything's bold, then nothing is bold. Um, good tip to live by. Um, so, yeah, these are uh, combined, so that gives us a bit more room to work with. Our status here, so we've kind of got a positive, we've got an okay, and we've got a uh, status here. So I've tried to use some color here to pick these out. Um, and just make it more visually obvious uh, what these do. Um, I've also combined color uh, with an icon. Uh, not everyone can see colors like, I, th I think I see colors normally, who knows? Um, but not everyone can. Uh, some people are red, green colorblind, there's other versions of it. Um, so, I've combined this with an icon to make it even clearer um, what that status is. And then on the end, we've got a bit more room for our actions, which is great. They don't have to be stacked anymore. And uh, I've combined them with some icons too. Um, these are really, like we said, like universal icons. Um, so they're really obvious to the user. I'm still gonna label them though. I want the user to be confident, especially when we have a delete action there too. Um, and then lastly with the table, uh, I'm not a huge fan of the really bold kind of lines in a table. And then when you combine it with a header that picks out that really bright color, um, it kind of directs your eye to that rather than the actual content. So uh, on the revised example, I've got um, a tinted back uh, top bit. And you can't really see it, which is a shame, but every second row uses a neutral tone to um, try and um, separate the rows rather than using those harsh lines. Um, so again, there's ways that we can apply some design um, choices to boring things like tables. The important thing with these though is to understand how these are gonna be used. In other cases, I might not be able to combine those uh, columns. Lastly, last example, and of course I wanted to include a cat 
in this one. This isn't my cat, unfortunately. She doesn't photograph very well. She's very shy. Um, but this is a, a hero image, header section, whatever you want to call it, um, for a website for a cat rescue. Um, so this typically an example that you might see. We've got an image, we've got our title, we've got our description, um, we've got two buttons there, and we also have our navigation. And this is fine, but I can't really see the cat. That's like the important bit. Um, <laughs> duh. Um, so how are we going to improve this? So the biggest thing for me here is that the text is uh, sort of readable on the left example, but because we're using a bit of overlay, it doesn't provide enough contrast, and I also can't see the cat. So, um, so my revised example here, what I've done is use, it's a different way of balancing the layout. Um, my image has a solid background to it, which is a great thing. Um, it has this yellow background. So I've just shifted the image over, done a different crop of it, like we spoke about in the photography section. Um, and then I've put that text into black. It has really good contrast against yellow. Um, so that kind of fixes our not being able to see the cat problem. And then we've got our two buttons. So in the first example, they've got the same level of importance. Um, I would say that the adopter cat is probably the more important one. So what I've done is I've set that in the black has a lot more contrast, is a bit more eye-catching, but our cat care option is still there as a secondary button. So we've got some hierarchy with our buttons. Uh, and then I've also thought about the navigation because that was sat on an overlay before. So I've sat it on its own kind of overlay. Um, but the big thing here that I've done is I've looked at what's the most important thing there. Let's think about the context um, of our menu and it's a cat adoption rescue site. They rely on donations from people. So what I've done is I've just pulled out that, that donate link because that's the most important. So yeah, essentially design doesn't have to be big or scary. It can be small changes to an existing thing or it can be uh, starting small to create something new. Um, and as long as you kind of have those principles in mind, um, you're probably on to a winner. Um, so yes, that is all we've got time for. Um, I've got a lot of stuff out of this presentation. Um, 60 minutes sounds like loads, it really does. Um, but I did some more stuff on fonts, color, and white space. Like, designers will bang on about white space, uh, <laughs> which I really wanted to do, but there just wasn't enough time. Um, so if you've got anything that you're working on or want to work on, if you want some tips and advice from a designer, today is the time to get some free advice. <laughs> um, so please come and find me. I will be around all day. Um, I'm also going to tweet out this slide deck on my Twitter, which is at Loftio, because um, it's got those links to the resources. So yes, thank you so much.